Welcome back, everyone, from the break. Uh, I hope you had a relaxing uh, Lent vacation. Um, it's an opportunity to maybe think a bit about the content of the lecture so far. We're back today, and we're starting, as always, with feedback, which was pretty good last time, which is not so surprising, because it was a pretty hands-on lecture with, in a way, not so much new content, just a re recap of what we've done so far. And the feedback was, in general, quite positive. I'm leaving out a lot of positive co uh, comments, but some people said that they, well, sort of expectedly liked that we got to talk about a concrete application, a concrete question, and how to realize it in code. And then um, some people said that I'm, again, talking too loudly. So how is it now? Good? OK. There are actually two people who said it was too loud again. I can always turn it a little bit further down. And if I get too loud, then I don't know. Somehow let me know. Um, some people didn't like the visualizations. And there were several questions about this final step in the last lecture about hyperparameter optimization. So we will get back to that in the next one or two lectures, and then we'll talk about it for several lectures, actually. But before we get to that point, there's also a question about how to interpret the uncertainty in the plots and how the adap adaptation of hyperparameters actually helps to get uncertainty calibrated. That, too, we will do like half a lecture about to cover this bit, um, although not today, actually. So the plan for the next few lectures is that, in a way, you could say when we've now reached kind of the methodological toolbox that we need to cover a, the vast majority of contemporary machine learning, and we're going to, in some sense, spend a lot of time thinking about it. So I could. I could cheekily say we're going to slow down now and like, take our time to think about many different aspects of these models. It's probably not going to feel like slowing down, but we'll see. And I want to start today with a lecture tri that tries to build a theoretical, cleaner understanding of what we've been doing so far, in particular also with connection to the statistical machine learning class that many of you are in as well. So what we've seen so far, as a quick recap, is that we can use the mechanism of, or we can, we can sort of represent and realize the mechanism of probabilistic inference, which in general is quite abstract and maybe even intractable, on contemporary computers quite efficiently in fact, using just linear algebra, when we phrase everything in terms of Gaussian distributions over random variables that are linearly related to each other. So there are two important steps there, linearity and Gaussianity. And then we saw that we can use, we can even sort of use this computational mechanism to learn functional relationships between variables, supervised machine learning to learn functions. And we do that by expressing functions first in a parametric form, so through some mapping of the input x into some weight space, and then do Gaussian regression on the weights. But we actually discovered that it's possible to, take, to sort of consider an infinite set of weights at once through a notion that is associated with this concept of a Gaussian process, and which I introduced on the code side as a, as a form of lazy functional style programming, where the Gaussian distributions are initially just represented by functions that get called at whenever we actually need it to instantiate a finite dimensional Gaussian distribution. And, and we cons this sort of these objects are, are defined, these Gaussian process objects are defined through this mean function and the covariance function, um, which are objects that we work with. And I'll say more about them in a the moment. In, in the moment. Uh, well, one thing I did point out is that these covariance functions have this interesting property that they are positive definite, and the term for positive definite functions is that they are a kernel, or is sort of kernel. Right? And 
this is the point where I should ask you, in the statistical machine learning class, have you talked about kernels yet? Not yet. What are you currently doing in this stats ML class? Dangerous. I might tell Professor Hein afterwards what you said. No? No? I shouldn't have said that. No. <laughs> Does anyone want to say, like, what, what was the title of the last lecture before, before the vacation? <laughs> I don't think you've had one yet. No? OK, but you're operating already in a four-year basis, OK? OK, so empirical risk minimization on convex problems. OK, so that sounds, though, like you're getting close. OK, so kernels are traditionally a concept that is quite central to statistical machine learning. And depending on what Professor Hein wants to do this term, he's, like me, adapting the content all the time. He might spend quite some time talking about kernel machines. We'll see whether he does or not. So, but you probably all have heard that there are, there's a thing called kernel machines, right? Okay, hands up. Who has heard of kernel machines in, in machine learning? Eh, that's uh, more than half, but not much more than half, okay? So, there is traditionally a big part of machine learning. And in fact, up until about sort of, let's say, 27 or so, um, from the late 90s to for, for like a, roughly a decade, machine learning was pretty much dominated by kernel machines. And if I use the word kernel, it's sort of natural to ask, is there a connection to them? So what I want to do today is try to get a cleaner understanding of what we've been doing so far with Gaussian processes from the mathematical side, and how they relate to the frequentist methods called kernel machines. And a few questions that you could ask in this concept are these Gaussian processes they seem to be quite abstractly defined. That is, lazy objects that are defined through mean functions and covariance functions. Do they even define something that is uniquely defined? Like, so if you're a mathem mathematical person, that's sort of a natural question. We, are they, do they define one probability measure? Is this uniquely ad identified? Is this like a probability distribution over functions? What kind of spaces of functions are they uh, creating a distribution over? Um, these kernels, since you haven't heard about them in statistical machine learning yet, what are they? Positive definite functions. Um, can I think of them as like generalizations of matrices? And then are they related to kernel machines? And actually, that last question I'll, I should have removed because I'll do it in a later lecture. But it's a natural question to ask already. If I use an infinitely wide neural network, so if I track, track infinitely many features, does that mean I can somehow build an infinitely powerful learning machine? And the answer to that is actually quite intricate, because it's sort of both yes and no. So what I'm hoping for is, and I'm going like high level slowly, is that we're, you can leave the lecture today with the following four answers slightly more concretely in your head. The first one is that, indeed, Gaussian processes define a probability distribution over spaces of functions. With a caveat that the space of functions that we have to consider when we think about them this way is very vague. It's so vague that it's very difficult to even do much with it. But because the objects that define a Gaussian process are kernel functions, we can study that object, the kernel function, more specifically that sits inside of the Gaussian process to get a more concrete idea of what the, the distribution actually looks like. In particular, also by drawing connections to the frequentist framework of, st of statistical machine learning and the kernel machines there, identifying some quite close connections between the two that will help us understand what Bayesians and frequentists actually are on about, but also identifying some very subtle differences between them, in the sense that the objects we study in the end are not actually the same ones, although they allow interpretations to be 
sort of transferred between each other. And again, that fourth sentence I should have removed five minutes before the lecture because I decided not to do it today. So what's going to come now for the next 90 minutes, well, actually 70 odd minutes, is a lot of math. And I know that not everyone likes lectures that have a lot of math. Today's lecture has pretty much no pictures. Our last lecture was lots of pictures and visualizations. Today, there's almost no pictures. So advance apologies that there will be a lot of theorems flashing by. And you typically won't be able to get all the details. But I kind of have to show you the theorems to explain how the math works. So, you, so your mental goal for today shouldn't be to get everything we're going to be talking about in, in detail or like remember all of it for the exam. That can't work. But to get a gist of what the mathematicians are trying to tell you when you sort of squint your eyes with these theorems. And that will lead to, an, to these four kind of high-level answers, or actually just three high-level answers that I had on the previous slide. And that will form a foundation on which we can operate in later lectures, and which allows us to use a few words, a few big words, to sort of make sure we understand what we're doing. And those of you, I know that there are some of you who always like to have even more math. If you'd like to know more, you can come to the front during the break and also at the end and ask me and also Marvin Fertner, who is sitting here in the front, um, for more questions. He's sort of here as my uh, fact checker and linter, so that when I say something wrong, he can like, say, no, 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 not quite. Um, and, uh, and we'll see. OK, yeah, and if you really want to know much more details, you can read any of these three papers or even books. Uh, there's even more. Um, yeah. Uh, OK, so the question is, is the Rasmussen and Williams outdated on this? No, it's not outdated. It's just not very theory heavy. So if you look at that book, there's, there's a chapter at the end. I think it's chapter 8 or so that has some connections and equivalences to other uh, frameworks. But it's relatively high level. Um, also because these two, I mean, so it's, that chapter, I think, is written by Chris Williams. But it's not as deep as these, as these uh, um, representations. By the way, someone asked at some point, about um, whether uh, one can reach all possible kernels from a set of kernels by combining them, wherever you are. I, I can give you an answer, a so, sort of answer in the break or afterwards. I just don't want to do it here because it's just going to confuse people even more. But if you like to hear something about non-computable kernels, fuck us at the end. So let's take a sort of more careful look at um, what these Gaussian processes actually are. So your first question might be, is this abstract object, what actually is it? So here is a refined definition of a Gaussian process that is pretty much the same that I've, I've already used in the previous lectures, but it's now a little bit more specific. So a Gaussian process um, is a random variable, f, over an index set. Um, or actually, it's a family of real-valued random variables which sort of we can write like this, and I'll explain to you what this, what this notation means in a moment, um, on a common probability space such that every finite combination of function values or random variables evaluated at finitely many locations follows a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So what this notation introduces is sort of a second object. So, so far, we've talked about f of x as a random object. And in this definition, there, we're a bit more concrete about the fact that there is some randomness being injected. And you can think of that um, actually, well, I'll first tell you what the second definition is, and then we can t talk about the joint thing a little bit more concretely. Um, you can think of this distribution through, in particular, two objects. First, the so-called mean function. The mean function we can define more concretely as the function that gives us for an, a finite combination of input points, the expected value of this stochastic object process. And secondly, the covariance function. So the covariance function is the function that takes these random variables and then computes for every finite combination of inputs the covariance between function values at those points. 
So that's a definition that doesn't use the word kernel at all. It's a definition from the probabilistic perspective. Here is an object that defines a probability distribution through this kind of construction. And in particular, it defines the randomness, the stochasticity, the probabilistic aspect quite concretely. You can think of these objects x, uh, f of x as, at, 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 as random variables that are concretely sort of they take in randomness from some underlying probability space through this mapping with this omega object. So you could draw omegas first from some base space, somehow make sure that, and then somehow, somehow make sure that the resulting f of x and omega are Gaussian distributed. And that's actually exactly what we do in the code. So the, the, the Python code that you've used so far very directly constructs exactly this kind of object. So we instantiate these objects mean and covariance by evaluating our lazy objects, by like forcing them to evaluate at a particular set of points. And then we effectively take a, random, a, a set of random bits make sure that they're like transform them such that they give standard Gaussian random variables through whatever, the box Muller transform or the Ziggurat algorithm or whatever, and then multiply them from the right onto the Cholesky decomposition of the covariance matrix and add the mean. So clearly this is an object that depends both on where you evaluate and what kind of random thing you want to put in. You could also think of this as some kind of jacksnumpy dot or jacks.random.key kind of object, right? There's this underlying source of randomness that constructs these objects. So the definition here is one of a probability distribution that has certain properties. It has a mean and a covariance function. And that's a formal definition for a Gaussian process. Every Gaussian process has a mean and a covariance function, of course, because every Gaussian has a mean and a covariance. And so if you instantiate at any point and get a Gaussian distribution, you can instantiate these objects. But as I already sort of slipped in during the presentation, every one of these covariance functions also is a kernel. So a kernel is an object, is a function that constructs matrices that are always symmetric, positive, semi-definite. And um, that's, well, here's a proof for it, but actually, I mean, you can look at the proof afterwards. It's pretty much just saying covariances are positive semi-definite matrices. So therefore, any covariance function is a positive definite function. And if you call positive definite functions kernels, if you use the word kernel for short, then every covariance function is a kernel. But actually, it turns out that the same statement also works the other way around. And that's much less obvious. So every kernel, every positive definite function, defines a Gaussian process. You can think of every kernel as a covariance function. In the specific sense of this lemma up here, which um, comes from this paper in 2014, right? a book, actually. Ah, introductory book. Um, it says for every function, every, every function m or mu or m, yeah? and every positive definite kernel, there is a Gaussian process with this mean and this covariance function, or with the m as, the, as its mean function and k as its covariance function. This is sort of a statement about the existence of Gaussian processes as well-defined objects. So we are allowed to do this functional style approach to constructing distributions over, well, some space of functions because of this construction. And so the proof of this is actually not so straightforward and it relies on a, a somewhat, in my opinion, somewhat weird kind of theorem that is called the Kolmogorov extension theorem. It actually took me a long time, like Marvin has tried to convince me that it's very useful for a long time. It took me a while to understand why it's useful. Um, this is also the first time I do these slides in this kind of lecture, so I have to think about them myself. Um, this Kolmogorov extension theorem it's, really says 
you are, we are allowed to do what we do in our code. In the sense that, here's the theorem below, if, actually, I'm going to read out this, the, 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 this theorem, and then you can think about it together. So this theorem says, and it's quite old, actually, from Kolmogorov, right? Consider a non-empty index set, I. Assume we're given a bunch of, let's say, well, Borel spaces, so measurable spaces for every possible I in the index set. Now consider the set of all finite non-empty subsets. So that's a thing we can think about. It's the thing you can actually call on the computer, the object that the call function can operate on. Then any so-called projective family of probability measures, I'll say what that means in a moment, uniquely, that's the operative word, defines a probability measure on the measurable space given by, well, sort of the product space of all of these. Um, elements of the index set. How? Through this kind of operation, which actually also defines what a projective family of probability measures is. It's a collection of probability measures for which you can construct from one joint probability measure the, a projection, so a subset, the, the measure on a subset, by taking the um, probability measure sort of backwards through some operator that just selects points in the index set. And this is, the, you, can, you can tell that I'm sort of a bit weak here because this operation is so elementary. It really just says, if I can pick objects, a finitely many objects from this index set, I, and can pick it in some sense sort of meaningfully, then this works. And this meaningfully can actually be defined a little bit more concretely. There are variants of it. If you check the Wikipedia entry for the Kolmogorov extension theorem, you'll get a quite different statement, which is sort of a bit more concrete. And it says what you need to be able is you need to be able to select from this index set i such that the resulting pj are, they, they sort of work under permutations and under selecting parts of it and ignoring the rest. So, this is an extremely weak kind of definition. So to, the only thing we need to be able to do on these spaces is to select a bunch of finitely many input points. And this is true for pretty much any space you want to define this over. In particular, also uncountable spaces like the real line. That's why this is a powerful statement, actually. So, what this theorem really just says is you can define these objects called Gaussian processes if you can define the operation call that we have on, in our code. So if the x space that we're operating over allows us to do call on x, and call returns an array, and arrays have all the properties we need, we can permute their entries, we can drop parts of it in particular, so we can slice through the arrays, so if there is an operation that returns an array, then we're good. Then we can define a stochastic uh, process on this space and call it a Gaussian process. And that's kind of cool because it means this is a very powerful statement. It's a very general concept we can use on crazy complicated spaces. It's also, in a sense, sort of a, a problem, and actually this is on the next slide, because the that space itself, or this, this kind of property itself, is so weak that it's very difficult to do anything with it. So here's what the slide says. Um, if you sort of think of it, your construction the other way around, so you um, think of a function f that isn't yet instantiated, but it already has its, in some sense, its random key, right? then you can think of this as a sort of a sample path, as a function that hasn't yet been created, but we can now call it. Um, this is a well-defined construction, as you can probably tell if you've looked at our code, because that's sort of what we do, right? Um, and that means there are actually, these, these objects actually kind of exist in this sense. They exist in the sense that we can construct code that draws from them. So in this sense, this object, f dot omega is actually a well-defined random variable, and that's 
why we can think of Gaussian processes as probability distributions over a space of functions. And that's the kind of object that gets studied in stochastic analysis from a probabilistic perspective. Just a moment. And the only problem we have with this is that this construction, which so far hasn't used the covariance function at all, it just says there is an object called the covariance function that defines the covariance of this process. It defines a distribution on a space that is extremely unstructured. It's this so-called uh, product space of, uh, no, this, the, the, the so-called product sigma algebra on R to the input domain. It has, it's, in particular, it's not, a, it's not a space with a norm, so therefore we can't measure distances between functions. It's just some very, very, very general space. And it contains all sorts of crazy functions, like, for example, this sort of function that is zero everywhere except for one real number, where it is one. That's a function that is extremely unstructured, right? Um, and it's not the kind of space that we typically want to operate in. So if you want to ask analytic questions, like how quickly can I learn one function? Or are the sample paths that this thing produces somehow well-structured? Are they con uh, continuous? Are they differentiable? Do they have certain upper or lower bounds in expectations and so on? Then it's, um, we need more structure to work with. And that's why most of the analysis for Gaussian processes actually uses additional structure in the object that has to come from somewhere. So it comes from the mean function, and in particular from the covariance function. So if you want to study how a particular Gaussian process behaves, you need to study the covariance function, the kernel. And that's where a lot of structure is going to come from. But there was a question. Back to slide six. Ah. So the question is, can I, can I say again why it has this particular, this f of x and omega has this, this particular form? Actually, it doesn't necessarily have to have this particular form. So the definition just says, we want an object that produces functions that have this property. So for every finite combination, uh, 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 multivariate Gaussian distribution. So you can construct such an object in very different ways. In particular, if you are given a mu and a k, you could also say, whenever you give me an index set x, I, and in fact, that's actually what we do in the code, um, I'm going to construct kxx, then I'm going to construct a singular value decomposition of it that consists of two matrices, u and d, let's call them, and then I call mu x plus u times the square root of d times omega. That's another construction for Gaussian random variables. Or if your omega isn't actually Gaussian distributed yet, it's just... In, uniform random variables between 0 and 1, then you first apply a transformation to those to make them Gaussian and so on. So this slide, or this, this equation really is just supposed to say, here is a concrete way of taking a bunch of random numbers and turning them into Gaussian joint random numbers, which have this particular mean and this particular covariance. Is this, is this the, what you are getting at? Okay. I think maybe the, for most of you at least, the, the best way to, to take this, like take something away from this slide is the code we wrote is really precisely the definition of these objects. Because what does it do? 
it has a sample function which says, give me mean and covariance function by constructing the object first. And then I can, you, you could construct actually the sample, sample function such that at instantiation of the object, the Gaussian process object, we hand over a Jack's random key object. And that key thing is sort of related to this omega. It's not exactly equal to omega, but it's the thing that makes omega. It's the source of the randomness. And then you can construct, like, you, have, you have this program which produces random function values by, if I give it, give it an index set x, calling these two functions to construct these two objects. This is an array and this is a matrix. And then doing some linear algebra on it and calling the source of randomness to produce these samples. And it's actually also a nice aspect of JAX is that it makes it very concrete where this randomness comes from. You can fix the key, and then you'll always get the same function back. And if you change the key, you get a different function back. The important thing so far is these are actually, here's the sort of summary slide. GPs are indeed probability distributions over function spaces. They are function-valued objects, function-valued random variables, and they are well-defined in this sense. So the construction with a mean and a covariance function uniquely identifies one probability distribution over a space of functions. There's also a downside to this very probabilistic approach, which is that this space of functions that it is defined over is pretty much unstructured if we haven't talked about the kernel and the mean yet. That doesn't allow us to say much about the functions we're going to draw. So if you want to think about what kind of properties this Gaussian process object has, we need to look at the kernel in particular. We already realized that the mean function isn't so important. We can always just subtract it, and then we have a zero mean function GP. But we have to look at the kernel as the defining object and look in structure with this, uh, of this kernel to get a better feeling for what kind of learning machine we've actually built, what it actually does, what kind of samples does it produce, what kind of functions can it learn, and so on. So we have to think about these kernels again. And since you haven't looked at them yet in statistical machine learning, that's actually maybe good. I can give you the very intuitive introduction to them. And I have the advantage that I don't have to teach the statistical machine learning class. So I can sort of ride right over the, these concepts and leave out some of the nasty proofs and um, leave them to Professor Hein to talk about them when he actually gets to them. I'll send him an email and remind him to do that. So, um, first of all, the most important thing about these kernels, again, is that they are functions of two inputs which we use to construct arrays, two-dimensional tensors, also known as matrices, by putting in two sets of inputs and then broadcasting onto, an, onto a matrix. And these matrices have the property that if you broadcast on an object with itself, you get a square matrix, which is symmetric positive definite. So, Matrices are objects we all know and you've all studied in, for a long time in uh, your undergraduate classes, in your first year undergraduate math lecture. You learned all about matrices and linear algebra. You learned that um, matrices in particular can be represented by uh, their eigenvalue decomposition, or actually more generally their singular value decomposition, but for the matrices that we care about, their eigenvector decomposition. Um, and in particular, for symmetric positive definite matrices, like the ones that we talk about here, we know that the eigenvectors are actually orthogonal to each other. Someone already pointed that out um, a while ago. And um, that their eigenvalues are all non-negative. So they are, if it's symmetric positive definite, they are all larger than zero. And if they are semi-definite, they are all larger or equal than zero. So um, this, these, any symmetric positive definite matrix can be written in sort of this way. Or maybe I should have called it V, lambda V transpose. Right? I can't, can't wipe out at the moment. Um, with a matrix of, that contains the eigenvectors, which are orthogonal to each other. So that's why we can write a transpose here rather than a minus one. And a diagonal matrix containing the non-negative eigenvalues. So, a natural question you could have is, if we now have these, these functions called kernels for which we write 
xx, this kind of object, then is this a little bit like this kind of representation? So can we think of these, this notation a bit like indexing into an infinite dimensional array? That's also why I actually use this suggestive notation with the subscript, because it looks a little bit like a matrix, right? So is this actually allowed? Can we do something like this? Do you, do you understand what I mean? Not really. So can I think of this as Right? So th this is what we actually call in the Jack's NumPy code, right? Well, with a lot of slicing and nuns and ellipses operators that you all are confused over during your exercises, I know. But this looks a bit like there is this function that spans an infinite dimensional matrix, and we are calling into it to get its elements. And in fact, it turns out that's actually true in some sense, but also not entirely. So. It's true in a technical sense that is realized through the following theorem by this guy, James Mercer, British mathematician, um, who um, studied these bivariate functions in particular. Um, and there is a, there's a corresponding concept for these functions to the concept of an eigenvector for a matrix. So an eigenvector is a vector v such that when you multiply the, the matrix with the vector, you get a scaled version of the vector, right? Where the scaling constant is called the eigenvalue. So for kernel functions, there's a corresponding thing called an eigenfunction, which has the property that when you integrate against this function, the kernel, you get back a scaled version of the function. And a scaling constant you could call an eigenvalue with respect to this eigenfunction. There's a question. So the question is if you're thinking of um, symmetric positive definite kernels, should we think of a uh, complex value? Oh, why do we have complex valued um, eigenvalues here? So this is the general case for symmetric positive definite kernels, um, these lambdas will be real valued. Um, but you can define eigenfunctions more generally on such operators. Um, and so huh? this is true. And actually, it turns out, and this is the theorem by Mercer, that one can, just like we can take any symmetric positive definite matrix and write it like this in terms of its eigenvectors and eigenvalues, you can also write any positive definite kernel as a sum, sum is important because it's over a countable space of indices, over something like an outer product of the, co uh, the eigenfunctions times the eigenvalues. So this here is really like, OK, I can even match the indices, right? So this is like k or a. Uh, I'm just going to do it. A, B, A, I, lambda, I, I, because it's diagonal, I, B. Right? That's exactly the same kind of construction. So in this sense, e you can actually think of kernels as an infinite valued matrix that we're indexing into, which has a basis formed by these eigenfunctions. But there's a little caveat, which is that there is really only one way up to isomorphism of counting over the, um, the natural numbers. So if you have a vector that contains elements at finitely many locations, then it's clear what's happening here, right? This sum operation is natural. I've left out the sum, actually, but it's a sum over i, right? But there isn't really, you can't really do anything other than permuting the, the way you count. But for real-valued or general input uh, spaces, x, 
we have to say how we integrate, what the summation actually does. And that's why we need a measure over the space, new. And that measure actually introduces all sorts of complications. Because if you change the measure, which you can in non-trivial fashion, in particular, it could be a probability measure, and we know that there are many different probability measures, or what, even the real line, then you get different eigenfunctions. So what the eigenfunctions actually are depends on how you measure them. That's annoying. But it's just an unavoidable problem in spaces with uh, less structure than the natural numbers. So in the sense of this theorem, we can vaguely think of kernels as infinite dimensional matrices. You're sort of allowed to do that, but we have to be a bit careful because if you want a concrete representation of these infinite dimensional objects, if you want to instantiate them in terms of some basis, then one way to get that basis is to use the eigenfunctions, but that basis is only relative to some base measure that we need to define or construct. A natural question you might have that I'm not going to answer, and I'm going to leave it to Matthias Hein, is, well, what are the eigenfunctions? What do they look like? You've, I've shown you these kernels, right? The square exponential kernel, the Matern family, all of these different kernels. And you could ask, well, what, what do their eigenfunctions look like? Can you show some examples? And I'm not going to do that. In some specific cases, the eigenfunctions are actually known, for example, for the Matern family. But in general, it's actually not so straightforward to figure out what the eigenfunctions are. The fact that the eigenfunctions exist helps us to think about what kind of objects we talk about, but we won't typically be able to actually write them down. Instead, we can ask, well, why do we even want to think about kernels in terms of matrices or infinite dimensional matrices? Well, because we want to think of Gaussian processes in terms of Gaussian distributions. We want to somehow get from this function-valued object, Gaussian process, onto some more like, tangible representation over a finite dimensional index sets that we can do analysis on. In particular, we might want to ask, what kind of space of functions do these kernels somehow span? And does that space that they span have something to do with the Gaussian process that we're operating with? This is maybe not a super concrete question if you want to just do machine learning and train large language models, but since this is a lecture called probabilistic machine learning, we kind of really have to answer it to get a sense of what probability distributions we actually work with. So what we've seen so far, just as a quick summary, is Gaussian processes are indeed distributions over function spaces, and they are directly like, identified by the kernel that we choose. We need to look at the kernel to understand their structure, uh, because just the fact that they are Gaussian processes is too weak. Now we've just discovered that these kernels actually provide some interesting structure. For example, we can think of them, uh, with some caveats, as infinite dimensional matrices. So matrices span spaces, right? And when, you, when I write down a matrix, you could then ask, well, what is its basis? So what are, what are its eigenvectors? And what are the eigenvalues? So therefore, what is the image space of A? Right? What kind of vectors can I index with A? And similarly, you could ask through a kernel, what is the space of functions I can reach through this kernel? that I can represent with this kernel. And then a natural question is, what does that have to do with Gaussian processes, which so far we've defined as probability distributions? So I will do that after the break. Um, now we'll take a five minute break, and I'll continue at 11.05. If you have any questions of more detailed nature, you can come to the front. Oh, um, yeah, minor correction here. My, my uh, mental linter has already helped me uh, dis discover one, one, th one thing I said wrong in the first part of the lecture. I said this object called a, fa a projective family of probability measures is defined through this operation, but I have to be a bit more careful. Actually, a projective family of probability measures is a family that is defined on sort of PI. So if you have a finite dimensional probability distribution already, then a projective family of probability measures is one on which you can 
do this operation if you have a subscript i in the p. What the theorem says, what the cohomology extension theorem says, is that there is a projective limit where you can do this on the full p, actually, even if p is not countable. But really, what this theorem says is, if you can implement a kernel on your computer, on a Turing machine, then it defines a Gaussian process. That's pretty much what this theorem says. Because what is a kernel? A kernel is a function that takes in inputs from whatever the space is, even if it's a very exotic space, and it returns an array. And arrays have, as objects, as objects in programming languages, have exactly the properties we need. You can take the elements of an array and permute them, and then you can permute the corresponding dimensions of the distribution. And you can take the array and slice into it. So you can take subsets of the, the array. And that's exactly the two operations you need to be able to do. So when you can do that, then you can define a Gaussian process. So what, so what this theorem says is, if, if I define a Gaussian process with mean function and covariance function, mu and, and uh, k, then there is a space called, actually it's on the next slide, right? Called r to the x. It's even a weird notation, yeah, but that space actually is well defined. And the samples that this process is going to draw will lie somehow in that space. But you would like to have something more concrete. You'd like to be able to say, well, maybe there is a space in here called, I don't know, C2, the space of all twice continuously differentiable functions. Is the sample going to be in there as well or outside? Marvin. So maybe the notation isn't actually clear, but the R to the X means the space of all functions from X to R. So that literally every function you can think of from X to R is in there. And the, this one example of the, the, the directional function is a particularly ill behaved example, um, which in this, like, if you actually want to learn a function like this, you would actually. Yeah, yeah, it depends on omega, um, but... No, 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 because omega is already, this is the space of samples now. So this yeah. is for, for a fixed, uh, for a realization of omega. Exactly, this is essentially what you get if you sort of consider, if, if you were to iterate over all omega and then sort of, sort of uh, throw all of these functions in the bag. Iterate. Sort of. Like you can't, because typically omega yeah. is, is uncomfortable, but yeah. So, but I, I still would like to point out this picture, right? So what this construction, the probabilistic construction kind of provides is just to say there is a meaningful space within which all the samples lie. They exist, they are well constructed, and they're in there. But if you want to analyze this object, we need to get a bit deeper into the kernel to understand where the samples actually lie. And now what we're going to do next is we'll discover that you can actually use the fact that they are kernels and draw from insights from statistical machine learning to get a kind of inner bound on where the samples might lie. But inner bound, what that means, we're going to see in a moment. So it's going to be like approximating them from the inside, if you like. And here, the high level takeaway is Gaussian process regression is just one particular way of talking about a conceptual framework and analyzing it and studying it that has been dis discussed for, well, pretty much the entire history of quantitative thinking of mathematics. It's related to notions that you may have heard in other lectures. Uh, probably non none of you have heard of Krieging. Has anyone heard of Krieging? No? Ah, you know. So it's a historical term that comes from the geosciences or our colleagues down the street over there. In the geoscience department, if you have a lecture on how to build smooth maps, you might learn about Krieging, which is pretty much the same concept. It's just more, a little bit less, con less generally defined. Um, but maybe most importantly, it's related to kernel rich regression, which is a concept that I'm pretty sure you're going to hear about from Professor Hein. It's also sometimes called Wiener Kolmogorov prediction for historical reasons, and it's linear least squares regression, as we already noticed. So just to make that connection clear again, if we consider f restricted concretely to a particular set of inputs, so if we sort of 
ignore for a moment the theoretical complexity of instantiating the GP on a concrete set of inputs, and imagine we've already done that, then we can think of what we do as Gaussian regression. So we have some prior over function values, which is Gaussian, um, and a likelihood, which is Gaussian and has a linear relationship to the function values. We do Bayesian inference, so we multiply the prior by the likelihood and normalize by the evidence. We already know what the evidence looks like. That gives us this Gaussian process posterior, which has a mean function and a covariance function. Now, we can think of this mean function as, first of all, as also as the mode of the distribution, because Gaussians, well, yeah, we all know what Gaussians look like, right? They are these bell-shaped things. And so the mode is equal to the mean for them, conveniently. So we can also compute the posterior mean by, or find the posterior mean, if you wanted to know it, by maximizing the posterior distribution. So that means we can also um, minimize minus the logarithm of that distribution, or oh, that's not right, forget about this, but just this line, and minimizing minus the logarithm of this distribution. Um, and, and what's the logarithm of a Gaussian? Well, Gaussians are exponentials of minus squares. So if you take the logarithm, the exponential goes. And if you take the minus, we just have a square. And this is this loss function that we're minimizing. So we can think of the point estimate that comes out of this object, the mean, as the minimum of this loss function. And so what is this? It's the square distance between the predicted function values and the observed function values, weighted by the label noise, the observation uncertainty, plus the log negative prior. And that's the square distance between the predicted function and the mean function as measured by the kernel covariance matrix, AXX. So here is the definition for it. So an inner product weighted by the inverse of the kernel matrix. So what we are computing here is the function fx, which we then call posterior mean, the function which minimizes the square distance between the predictions and the observations. It finds the solution of least squares. And that kind of idea has been studied for a long time because it's tractable. Probably the first person, yes? Ah, so the question is, what is with the little x and the capital X? So, um, OK, so the simple answer here is there's probably, there might well be some variations of little x and capital X on this slide. For the purposes of finding, um, well, OK, so you can think of, I think the slide is correct if you think of a dividing line between these two equations, right? So here on the left, we have a different kind of things on the left-hand side. And here you notice that it's just the expected value of f at the training points, capital X. So far, I haven't said anything yet about other x's, right? So that's what we, obviously what we do for generalized Gaussian process prediction. But if we, for the moment, only think of the capital X, the training points, then we're just finding the estimate that minimizes the square distances. And this is a concept that has been studied for a long time. Arby, the first person who might have studied it, is Andrien-Marie Legendre, French, French mathematician, of whom we apparently don't really have a proper painting. There's just this weird satirical sketch of one of his friends uh, that was made during a debate, I think. So he might have looked like this. Um, and he wrote in 1805, uh, I think 1805, actually, um, in French, right, about this method, which is quite simple and quite general. And it consists of finding the minimum of the sum of the squares of the errors. And we get this from equations with simple coefficients, which are quite easy to derive. And he even says further down here that he just put this in an appendix, these derivations, because they're not so complicated. Why? Because they're linear algebra. So you can construct them analytically with just you know, methodological uh, uh, algorithmic rearrangements of rows and columns of a, of a matrix. And then, so there is, depending on who your patriotic allegiance is with, some people say that the French invented the least squares method. And uh, so Legendre seems to have sort of thought of it. Um, 
well, no, to the Chandler seems to have published it first. But maybe at the very sort of around the same time, uh, for us Germans, Gauss also did sort of the same thing. He uh, published it later, but he claims to have worked on it earlier. So, you know, you can pick whichever one you like. In here he writes in German, um, the, the most probable system of the values of the unknown quantities must be the one in which the squares of the distances between the observed and the computed function values uh, achieve the smallest sum. Ah, so that's pretty precisely what we're doing, right? The most probable answer, the one with the highest probability, is the one which minimizes the square distance between the function values and the observed values. So, so far, Gaussian process regression, well, Gaussian regression, if we ignore the process bit for a moment, is just least squares. It's just constructing the smallest, like the estimate that minimizes the square distance to the observations. And there's even functions called least squares in NumPy, right, that do that for you. So this is classic linear algebra. And now the question is, is that all it is? Or is there something additional to it? Yes? Ah, so the question is, why do we even write down an optimization problem? Is it because we can't have a closed form for it? No, we do have a closed, I mean, the line above gives you the closed form answer. So it just happens to also be the solution of an optimization problem. Uh, so you don't have to do optimization. Yes, so we don't have to do optimi, well, we sort of, we do optimization. It's just linear optimization. It's just linear, so the, the process of computing this matrix inverse and multiplying a vector from the right, that's optimization. It's just the most basic version of optimization. So the mean happens to be the solution of an optimization problem, the answer to which we can find using linear algebra. And the point, like, what this says is, oh, it's, it's empirical risk minimization, what we're doing, right? It just happens to be that of a form where the solution is a closed form. Why? Because it's a quadratic loss function with a quadratic regular visor. And the sum of squares is another square, and the minimum of a square can be computed with linear algebra. But now, what about this, like the predictions at other points, at little x? How do they come about? So you remember that the posterior mean of this Gaussian process, actually it's in the slide, this thing up here, that's a function. I also sometimes write it with, these, with this bullet notation for little x, bullet and bullet, and then here bullet and circle, if you like. This object also can be evaluated anywhere outside. And it's created, mediated by this object called kernel k. So what is the space that these objects lie in? Well, we just saw that kernels can be thought of as matrices, with some caveats, and matrices span some spaces. So is there a space of functions that is spanned by this object? Well, there is. And so since Matthias Hein has not done that, to, has not sort of showed this to you yet, I can mention it to you. There is a thing called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. That's a space that is reproduced by our kernel. I'll tell, tell, you, tell you in a moment what that is. Actually, you know, I'll tell you now. No, I, no I, I can't tell you yet because I have to first tell you the other thing. It's a space that is reproduced by our kernel and it's a Hilbert space. Hands up, who's heard of a Hilbert space before? Ah, very good, almost everyone. So a Hilbert space is a space that has an inner product and therefore a norm. Hilbert spaces are wonderful spaces because they, you can measure distances in them. And we want to be able to do something like this. For example, because we want to be able to say that our machine learns what does it mean to learn? Well, it means that you get closer to the truth. Well, to get closer, you need to measure distance. So this is a very interesting candidate space because it allows us to say something about the distance between an estimate and a true function because it has an inner product. So how is it created? This is the, ge the, the general definition of such a reproducing kernel Hilbert space or often called RKHS because it just rolls off the tongue. 
Um, and it's very abstract and therefore maybe not quite graspable, but we'll, in a moment we'll see other ways of representing it that, is, that are maybe more tangible. So an ArcHS, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, is a Hilbert space, so it has an inner product, which is defined on functions um, in the following way. It has a so-called reproducing kernel, um, K, um, such that, first of all, that function k, when you pick one side of it, one of its inputs, to a particular input x from the space, big x underneath, that's a function, right? It's a one univariate function. You can think of this as sort of currying, right? Functional style programming. If you fix one of the inputs, you still have a univariate function left. That univariate function has to be in the space. That's the first thing. And then you can select a function value f of x through this operation below. And that operation below is this thing that's called representing a function. That's, the, that's where this word comes from. It says you can compute the value of f at a particular point by taking the inner product, which you can because it's a Hilbert space, so it has an inner product, right? The inner product with, of a function with the kernel. That's a, sort of, at first, it's a very abstract thing to look at. What ha has helped me in the past is the intuition that what this says is that the kernel is a little bit like a unit function. So for matrices, there's something called the unit matrix, which has the property that if you multiply the vector from the right-hand side onto it, then the ith entry of the resulting vector is equal to the ith entry of the original vector. And so here's a sum hidden in here over j. Here is an inner product, which is not necessarily a sum, but sort of something related to it. Right? This is the inner product between the operator i evaluated at i and j with the function v evaluated at j is the function v evaluated at i. That's what the kernel is. It's sort of like a unit thing. Yeah? haven't so far used it. We just, but the, the definition still works, right? Yeah, we could also just We won't. So let's think about that later, whether we actually need it or not. Okay. So the important thing is that there is a theorem that says every kernel spans an RKHS, and every RKHS has one kernel. There's a one-to-one -one map between kernels and RKHSs. So whenever you see a kernel, you can think of an RKHS. And in a statistical machine learning lecture, once you get to it, you'll probably do it this way. You'll, you, you sort of directly identify the object kernel with its RKHS, and all the analysis will take place in this space. So, um, that is a very abstract representation. So, a question you could have is, well, what do functions look like that lie in that space? Well, one way to represent functions that lie in this space is through the so-called reproducing kernel map representation. That's a more concrete way to construct the space, which, is, which says you can think of the space of all functions that can be written as finite sums arbitrary finite sums of, um, is it even true that it's finite? No, it, it doesn't, doesn't have, just has to be countable, right? So any countable uh, sum over weighted values of the kernel. Okay, good, here we go. Um, so you can think of Taking, and this is a little bit, again, like if you think of the kernel, like the unit matrix, the unit matrix is, the, is the, the matrix that has a basis that consists of the unit vectors, right? So you can write any vector as a linear combination of the unit vectors, the EI vectors, 
Similarly, you can write any function in the RKHS as a linear combination of the kernel, which is, is this sort of uh, way of representing the entire space. And because it's a Hilbert space, we also need to say what the inner product actually is. Well, here it is. It's, yeah, this. So sort of a sum over the coefficients of the functions uh, scaled by the values of the kernel at, at those points. And this is interesting because it allows us to draw a connection to what we've done so far, to Gaussian process regression. Why? Because this says, think of functions that can be written as weighted sums of kernels. Those are functions that are in the RKHS. And there is an object in our Gaussian process regression framework which is exactly like that. Can someone guess what it is? When we do the dot thing in the covariance matrix? If we do dot thing in the covariance matrix, maybe a little bit too vague. It's the posterior mean. So the estimate that our algorithm returns, this thing is a kernel function evaluated at all the training points and the input times a matrix, whatever, inverse times the, times the, the vector y. So matrix times vector is just a vector. So we can think of this mean function as a finite, for any finite data set, sum over kernel functions evaluated at arbitrary inputs and the training points with some weights which are given by the solution to this least squares problem. So you can think of the posterior mean in Gaussian process regression. Here's the one image in this entire lecture, this red thick line in the middle of this, of this object. You can think of this as a weighted sum of kernel functions centered or evaluated at the training points. So here, for this data set, you see the, the, the training points here below. At each point, there's a little dashed line that goes down and gives us one kernel value. Um, one kernel, so the kernel here is the square exponential kernel, this is this Gaussian kernel for this picture. Um, and we, uh, we just take these kernels and we weigh them by whatever the result of this least squares operation is. Um, some of the numbers are negative, some are positive, so you just plug them in and you get this weird family of weighted kernel functions. If you sum them up, you get exactly this red line in the middle. So the kernel rich estimate, kernel rich regression estimate, the posterior mean function actually is an object in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Well, I've already said the kernel rich estimate. Actually, I, I haven't introduced what that is yet. So there's a corresponding object in statistical uh, learning, which you will encounter pretty soon, which is this so-called kernel rich estimate, which um, is this object. So in the statistical machine learning literature is motivated differently, but it's this object that we already know. And it's motivated by saying, we minima minimize the so-called regularized L2 loss, where the L2 loss is this, and the this is something we already had, right? It's the, the square loss between observations and, and predictions, plus what's called the RKHS norm of F. So instead of minimizing the quadratic loss on exactly the training points, we can also minimize the loss in some function space. And it turns out, and I'll leave the proof to Professor Hein, that you can do this minimization in closed form because of some interesting property called the representer theorem, which allows you to represent this solution to this function valued optimization problem in a finite dimensional space. And you get an object out that has this form, and we know it already, it's called the posterior mean of our Gaussian process regressor. So what this means is that this is the new, the new line down here. <clears throat> Every kernel, is associated with this object called a producing kernel Hilbert space. That's a space of functions that is in some sense spanned by the kernel. And we've just noticed that one object that we work with, the posterior mean function of our Gaussian process regressor, happens to be in that space. And it can be motivated from an empirical risk minimization perspective as the L2, regularized least squares estimate. And that might sort of lead to a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to say, ah, so 
Why do we do GP regression in the first place? Why, couldn't we, why do we have to go to the probabilistic machine learning class and not just to the statistical machine learning class? It would be half as much work, right? Much easier this term. Is it maybe that GP regression is just kernel witch regression? It's the exact same thing. Why do we need to do this connection? Right? So for that, to answer this question, we have to think about two additional objects. Remember that our Gaussian process algorithm produced, well, at least two outputs, a mean function and a covariance function, a posterior covariance function trained on the data. And then we use these two objects to draw from a Gaussian distribution. We need to make a connection for the other two as well, the covariance function and the samples. Let's first do the covariance function. And so I realize we are 15 minutes before the end or so, so you're going to have trouble following, but I'll do it slowly because it's actually, for me, this is the, the pinnacle of this lecture. So it turns out that there is a statistical interpretation for this object called the posterior covariance function. This thing that we use in Gaussian process regression, we could have derived in a different way in the statistical machine learning class. So if I were the one teaching statistical machine learning, I would talk about this object. I'm not sure Professor Hein will do so. If he does, great. If he doesn't, you can ask a snarky question about it. So one thing you might care about if you're a frequentist is, so just remember how frequentist analysis works. We span a space of hypotheses. We say, this is the space of hypotheses we're willing to consider. Now we get some data. We would like to find an estimate within the space of hypotheses, which minimizes some risk. And then we can study that risk minimizer and you know, check whether it has some good properties of convergence or whatever. So we found that minimizer. It's called the kernel rich estimate. Or for us in this lecture, it's called the Gaussian process posterior mean. Hmm? So, there is a space of, I'm not going to draw it over here because that's just going to be confusing. There's a function, f. We don't know it. It's in this big space called r to the x. And we have now some kind of smaller space called the RKHS of k. We want to find the function which is closest to f as measured by the empirical risk. We found that thing. It's called mu x, the posterior mean of our Gaussian process. Now, what you'd like to know is uh, how far are we away, right? So that we can measure how quickly we converge. To do that, you could do a worst case analysis, because that's what frequentists like to do. You could say, how far could this estimate m, oh, actually, yeah, let's call it mx, how far could this estimate mx be from f. At worst, right? What's the worst that could possibly happen? Well, one problem with this is that um, it's a function space, so we can make lots and lots of functions in that space, and they can be arbitrarily far away from m. So to make the analysis meaningful, we have to say something additional about the f. We have to assume that it has a finite norm in the RKHS, or a bounded norm. And without loss of generality, the analysis then usually goes like, let's assume that the norm of f is actually unit. It's at most unit. Because if it's more than unit, we can just multiply by a constant. And then everything we do is just up to an unknown constant. OK. So we want to find the supremum over all functions in the RKHS. Oh, this is, ah, this is wrong, the picture I drew here. Stupid. Yeah, OK, that's not good. Ah, so it's actually, it's good that I made this mistake, because it might be useful to point out that that's not actually the analysis we do. Instead, we just consider the Hilbert space reproduced by k. And we say there is a function in there. And we are going to find our mx from the data. And we will assume that f actually is in the space, because it has bounded norm. That's the definition of it being in there. What you would like to do maybe is this. You'd say maybe f is anywhere. How close can we get? But that's got to be very tricky, because as I said at the beginning of the lecture, this space has really no structure we can use to measure distances. 
So we'll have to leave this question for another time and first think about this. So to answer a question like this, you would need to impose additional structure on F, right? You need to be able to say that it lies in some other space that has some structure in which we can measure distance. So we can't do that. Let's first assume that F is actually in the Hilbert space. Then we can measure this distance. And you know, you start with the prior mean, M0, and then our Gaussian process regressor or the kernel rich regressor will do some kind of path as we get more and more data, and hopefully it gets towards F. That's something we would like to achieve, right? OK, so we want this supremum norm distance. Um, now we first plug in what m of x actually is. So um, this is the definition of m of x that I had on the previous slide. It's this object defined through evaluating f at a bunch of points. That's our data. Let's assume we've measured data without noise for simplicity. So y is equal to f evaluated at location xi. Um, then the posterior mean is just this. That's just the posterior mean written the other way around, assuming we have prior mean zero. Do you follow so far? A few people are nodding. Many are not anymore. So this is from the previous slide. Well, here, right? If y is f of x, and we write this stuff together as wi as a vector, then, oops, ah, here, then this is our posterior mean. It's just plugged it in. Now we use this reproducing property, the definition of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is that we can write the evaluation of functions f at any location, in particular x and also xi, through inner products with kernels. So we just replace every instance of f evaluated at a particular point xi with um, um, the, and here, with kernel evaluations onto f. So that's by the definition of the reproducing property of the kernel from two slides ago. Then we use the fact that the supremum of such a square, this is an inner product between two objects, the left-hand side, let's call it A, and the right-hand side, F, let's call it B. Um, the supremum of such inner products is reached if the inner, the left and the right-hand side is, are equal to each other. So there's a formal way of, of, of proving this through the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality but I'm actually not going to do it. You, you can maybe convince yourself that the way to maximize the inner product between two vectors, if, if one of them has length one, f, is to just take them both to be equal to each other. So if we do that, so if we set here on the right-hand side, um, f is equal to the left-hand side to find the worst possible error we could have, then we get a square norm of this object. And now we can plug in the reproducing property again. Um, because why? what's the norm squared? Well, it's the inner product of this thing with itself. And whenever we take inner products of such functions which have a dot in it, we can use the reproducing property of the, of the RKHS and get back actual values of the kernel. Now we have an expression that doesn't contain weird function norms anymore, but just actual numbers. And the rest is just simple algebra. We plug back in what W actually is from up here, rearrange, and we find the object that we already know, the posterior covariance. So you can write a theorem that says, if um, we use a Gaussian process prior over an unknown function and assume that we make noise-free observations, we just measure the function wherever, wherever we, we train, then this posterior variance, the expected square error that the Gaussian process returns, the object that we've used in previous lectures, the object we've used to quantify error, to draw uncertainty bars around function values, actually the square of it, but whatever, can be identified exactly equally with the worst case approximation error that should be a minus, not an equal, between the estimate, the mean, and the true function, f, at any location x, actually, not just the training points, any location, under the assumption that f lies in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space and it has bounded norm. So this, I think, is quite interesting. Why? Because it gives us an intuition for how frequentist analysis relates to Bayesian analysis. 
you may have heard people outside of this lecture hall saying that frequentist analysis is more general. It just assumes a space of hypotheses. And then we typically do worst case analysis. We just assume that we get this estimate, which minimizes a risk. How bad could it possibly be? And then we have very general statements, which don't require priors. In particular, you can construct this estimate, this least square estimate, without ever talking about Gaussians anywhere. Right? You could say, there is a function which I evaluate at a bunch of points, and I regularize it with the RKHS norm. This gives me a, a kernel rich regression estimate, which minimizes the regularized square loss. And then I can make a statement that says, no matter what f is, as long as it lies in the RKHS and has bounded norm, the error is going to be bounded by this number. And equivalently, a Bayesian could come in and say, I never need to talk about RKHSs at all. I just define my Gaussian process regression algorithm, which defines a prior over function spaces, uh, over one function space, a prior measure over a function space, well-defined, as we saw earlier today, through a mean function and a covariance function. If I set the mean function to zero and use a likelihood that happens to be this sort of noise-free observation, which is a limit case of Gaussian likelihoods, then I get a posterior mean function, which is my expected function value, and I get a posterior covariance function, which in particular also gives me expected square distances, so average case errors, <coughs> between function values and the estimate, and it's given by, lo and behold, the exact same object. So the thing that the frequentist analysis would call the worst case error now actually happens to be the average case error for the Bayesian. So it's, it seems like the Bayesian made more assumptions because of this prior business, right? Gaussians, ooh, they're like random numbers. But actually, they ended up with a more cautious error estimate, an average case estimate, which is interpreted as a worst case estimate under the other form of analysis. The main thing I want you to get away from this, so here's the summary, final slide. Um, actually, not final slide, fi almost final statement. The posterior covariance function the average square error of the Bayesian is a worst case square error estimate in the RKHS. And you will hear about the RKHS, I am sure, in the statistical machine learning class. So when you hear people talk about worst case and average case analysis, it's a dangerous assumption to make that the worst case is always more conservative than the average case analysis. Because it depends on the assumptions underlying each framework. And what has happened here is that this frequentist analysis has made a pretty strong assumption that f lies in the RKHS. And then you can do a worst case error estimate. But so far, we started the lecture by saying the GP is only about this really big space, r to the x. And therefore, we haven't actually assumed that the function lies in the producing kernel Hilbert space. We just use this kernel, which happens to be our covariance function, and we do regression on it. And when we do that, the expected error to any function drawn from this process happens to be the exact same algebraic quantity. And that maybe gives you an intuition that this, the GP sample space, the space that the GP draws from, is probably not that space. Because if it were, our average case estimate would also, also be a worst case estimate, right? Because it is a worst case estimate in the RKHS. So we kind of know, we feel that the GP probably is a broader distribution. It's sort of between the RKHS and this full space, right? So um, I'm going to close the lecture by pointing out that this is, in fact, actually the case. Using three theorems that just happen to be true, but they are not entirely obvious. So the first one is, um, and we'll leave out the proof, I'll just say something. There's another way of thinking about the RKHS, which is sort of related to the one we just saw. So a few slides ago, I showed you this way of thinking about the RKHS, which is that you can think of the space of functions that are weighted sums over kernel evaluations. But if you think back that earlier in the lecture, I said you can think of the kernel 
as an infinite sum, countable infinite sum over eigenfunctions, then you can, can combine these two statements and say you can also think of these functions as a weighted sum over eigenfunctions in particular. Here it is. So the RKHS is also the space of all weighted sums of eigenfunctions, which have the property that the sum over their coefficients, a square coefficients, is, is uh, finite. And then we can also compute the uh, inner product in a maybe more direct way because we directly get uh, corrections through this representation. And then it turns out that there is actually a way of writing draws from a Gaussian process in terms of the eigenfunctions. It's called the kahun Löwe expansion due to two, I think, uh, Belgian mathematicians. Kahun and Löwe. Oh, Kahun is probably Finnish. Yeah, I have to look it up. Um, uh, which says that you can draw from a Gaussian process, or you can think of draws from a Gaussian process, because you can't really, because it's an, un like an infinite process, by considering the space of all eigenfunctions, weighing the eigenfunctions by their eigenvalues, uh, square root of the eigenvalues, and then drawing standard Gaussian random variables, IID. So you draw Zs that are drawn from independent Gaussians, 0, 1. This is the infinite dimensional version of the thing that I've wiped out, or that was on a previous slide. One way to draw from a Gaussian process on a finite dimensional domain is to just build a covariance matrix, take its eigenvalue decomposition, or a singular value decomposition, which is what this thing does, and multiply from the left with standard Gaussian random, random variables, and add the posterior mean, or the prior mean, whatever, the mean. So, this is a way of thinking about draws from a, from a Gaussian process. You can't actually do this in practice, of course, because the set of eigenfunctions is countably infinite in general. So you, you can't really implement this as a finite time algorithm. But you can write it down like this. And you can use it for analysis, which is actually I can put on this tiny little bit of space below, which is um, if you actually do this, Right, if you draw your functions like this and then compute the expected RKHS norm of these objects, you go back to the previous slide, you realize that we can compute norms like this. So that's the norm. Actually, it's the, that's the inner product. The norm, of course, is the in, inner product of f with itself. If we do that, then we get the expected sum of squares. But the draws are IID, right? So we have the assumption up here that they are independent of each other. So we can take the expectation inside of the sum. And they are standard Gaussians. So the expected square is just their standard deviation, uh, their variance, which is just one. So it's like an infinite sum over ones, which is not a series that converges. So draws from a Gaussian process are just not in the RKHS. So they are in a space that is broader than this space. And I think I will leave it at that and try to summarize here what we've done. So these, today was an abstract lecture, and no worries. Next Monday, by the way, there's no lecture on Thursday, right? Because it's public holiday. Next Monday, we will return to something a little bit more tangible. Still not so many pictures, but a bit more tangible. Um, but today, we had to lay some kind of concrete foundations. We saw that these objects called Gaussian processes are well-defined. Even though we define them on functions, they are well-defined if we can implement them, I'll say, on a Turing machine. So if you can write a piece of Python code that implements a kernel on your input domain, implementing a kernel means you write a function that returns a race, and arrays are things that you can slice into and with elements you can permute, then you can uniquely define a Gaussian process on this space. That's good. But that in itself doesn't provide all that much analytic tools to think about what the sample, actually, the sample paths of this distribution over functions will actually look like. So if you want to do some kind of analysis, for example, to learn to, no, to Convince yourself that this is a learning machine so that, it, that its estimates converge towards some true value. You need to, Marvin gives this, it, it sometimes says, hallucinate additional structure. You need to find some additional structure to think about. And um, that structure will have to come from the kernel. 
So what you now do is you stare at the kernel, you realize that kernels can be written as like, relative to some base measure as some kind of infinite dimensional matrix. And also they span some interesting spaces called a producing kernel Hilbert spaces. So a knee jerk reaction might be to study the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And this is not a stupid idea to do. It's just not the complete answer. It's not a stupid idea. Why? Because it allows us to draw a connection to frequentist analysis. It turns out that there is a corresponding algorithm called kernel rich regression, which produces point estimates, which are exactly equal to the posterior mean of the Gaussian process. And it produces, well, it can be made to produce worst case error estimates if you really want to. That's not something that's usually done in kernel rich regression, but you can construct them in the way that we did. And then you'll discover that the worst case approximation error for functions inside of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space with bounded norm is actually equal to the other object that our code returns, the posterior covariance. So in this sense, posterior covariances are uncertainty estimates. They are worst case error, est uh, error estimates inside of the RKHS, but they are also by definition average case error estimates in the sample space of the RKHS. Uh, the sample space of the GP. And that sample space is very patently not the RKHS. That's the final observation we've made. So that's why we have a course on statistical machine learning and one on probabilistic machine learning. One in which you, you learn to think in terms of losses and minimizing loss functions and then analyzing worst case errors and one in which we think in terms of distributions over spaces from which we draw random variables and then measuring result, uh, the, the resulting re remaining measure in the hypothesis space conditioned on the observations on the, in the conditional distribution. That's called Bayesian inference. And it turns out that in the particular case of least squares or Gaussian regression, these two are very closely linked. They produce the same point estimate, and they produce the same algebraic objects as their error estimates. It's just that we interpret them very differently, one time as a worst case error, one time as an average case error. And the, the underlying objects are different. In one case, we just return a point estimate called the rich regression estimate. And in one case, we return an entire distribution called the Gaussian process posterior. And that distribution is broader even than the worst case error estimate of the point estimate. Okay, I'll leave it at that. And on next Monday, Marvin will be here because I'm gone next week um, to talk about more like other aspects of Gaussian process regression. Thank you. <laughs>